yes, it's a piece of poetry, like the Psalms. It's scholars love the Song of Deborah because it's considered the oldest unedited piece of poetry in the entire Bible. So it's got historical interest. It's, it's, it's kind of got that pre-David feeling written all over it. I, uh, I'll, I'll read a bit when we get there. I think it's funny. Well, but, but, I, but, I, but I have that dark sense of humor. You have to when you're reading Judges. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Why do they say it's unedited? Uh, I don't the, know what that means. But. Looking at the language, it hasn't been updated. You can tell what stage of Hebrew you're looking at by the vocabulary they use. This is very archaic Hebrew. All right, we'll get there. Uh, quick look at author, date, and structure. Uh, the original author is anonymous. Funny enough, there's a fair chance we know the date this was first written. How's that for an overly exact guess? There's a fair chance the first draft of Judges was written right around 1005 BC, right after David became king. Why do we think this? Well, a few reasons. Starting with, number one, the author is pro-monarchy. He keeps telling us that around the time of the Judges, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right according to their own eyes. So this has got to be after the kings. The author is pro-David and anti-Saul. He begins the book of Judges by talking about how faithful the people of Judah are. That's David's tribe. And how wretched the tribe of Benjamin is. That, that's at the end of the book of Judges. And that's Saul's tribe. That doesn't seem to be coincidence. It's definitely not coincidence. We'll, uh, we'll go through that when we get there. This is a piece of pro-David political propaganda. Yay for the monarchy, yay for order, yay for, you know, the almost definitive savior of God's people. The author is very pro-David. But the fact that he's very anti-Saul seems, seems to indicate that this was written while David versus Saul was still a live issue. Finally, there's a line right at the beginning which says, the Benjaminites dwell with the Jebusites in Jerusalem to this day. That would be a really bizarre thing to write after David conquered Jerusalem. So it was probably written before David conquered Jerusalem, which gives us a very narrow window, right around 1005 BC. Then, like all the history books from Joshua to 2 Kings, Judges was put in final draft form during the 6th century BC, during the Babylonian captivity. And it was, it was harmonized with the book of Deuteronomy and uh, with the other books to give them all those, those same lessons, you know, worship God, not idols. Oh, and then quick structure of the book of Judges. Has anyone ever heard of, of chiastic structure to scripture before? No. I'm not gonna go deep into it right now, it's just too far out of everything that we have to discuss. But what that means is it was written where every single part of the book pairs another part of the book. There's a prologue with a matching epilogue, same themes. There are stories of the judges that match each other. They have the same themes. And the book finds its focal point in the story of Gideon. Why Gideon? The story of Gideon is all about who is the real king of Israel. Is it Gideon? Is it Baal? Or is it God? Then in the uh, prologue and the epilogue, both of them start with political, both of them start and end with political update. Uh, it begins with, so how's that conquest going? And ends with, not very well. <laughs> and then the next section in of the prologue, you get a, a theological analysis. So how's the moral state of Israel going? Uh, not very well. Oh, much worse. So there's mirrored themes all the way through. Again, kind of out of the scope of this class to go through them all. But this is something that happens a lot all throughout the Bible. Entire books of the Bible, Gospels are written this way, entire sections within the Bible, like uh, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, so many other pieces of it are written this way. It's something to know about and to keep your eyes open for. It can help unlock meaning. Common literary device Hebrew ancient world. Finally, a word on the violence. There's a lot of violence in the book of Judges, a lot, and yet, 
it doesn't really have the same moral issues that the violence in the book of Joshua does. Why? Well, there's two kinds of violence in this book. Number one, the Israelites fight their foreign conquerors to protect their lives and regain their freedom. This is seen in the book as a good thing. Hard to argue with that. Number two, the Israelites fight each other. This is always seen as a bad thing. Not, uh, not commanded by God, but the fault of the people's sin and disunity. Hard to argue with that. The stories of the judges, these are not stories written for Puritans. <laughs> these are stories that soldiers told around the campfire 3,000 years ago. They are filled with sex and violence and all kinds of political incorrectness. These are stories of freedom fighters, meant to be a told around the campfire where you cheer for the good guys, boo for the bad guys, and laugh and cringe at the, sa at the same time when the evil fat king is stabbed in the belly and his guts come spilling out. So, <clears throat> without further ado, the Book of Judges. <laughs> the Book of Judges begins with that update on the conquest. After Joshua died, the tribes were supposed to continue the conquest individually. How did they do? Well, the opening lines of the book tell us, Judah did great. Remember, this is all pro-Judah, pro-David propaganda. The tribe of Judah conquered the city of Bezek and captured its notorious king, Adonai Bezek. They cut off his thumbs and his big toes. And Adonai Bezek said, 70 kings with their thumbs and big toes cut off used to pick up scraps under my table. Thus God has repaid me for all the evil I have done. And then he dies. Kind of sets the tone for the rest of the book. But that's not all. Judah went up against Jerusalem and conquered it. Judah took three of the great Philistine cities too. Gaza, Ashkelon, Ekron. Now all of these cities must have been retaken by the Canaanites later on when Israel stops following God because they don't stay under Israelite control. Or certainly not in Israelite control, you know, in the time of young David. Um, but Judah, at least, at this point in history, is proud that it did its job. Benjamin, on the other hand, the tribe of Benjamin, never even tried to conquer Jerusalem. Boo! <laughs> then, all of a sudden, in the middle of the rah, 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 there's a strange little story about Caleb's family. Caleb captures Hebron. You all remember that from last week. To inspire the other men of Judah to continue the conquest... Caleb announces, whoever attacks Kiriath Sefer, the next city, and takes it will win my daughter Aksah as his bride. So Caleb's nephew, Othniel, leads the men of Judah to victory, and he takes Aksah as his bride. Caleb gives his blessing, gives the two of them land, then Aksah asks her father for springs of water, and he gives her the upper and lower springs. What does this mean? What is this story doing here? It's, uh, it's kind of a nice, sweet story, but why is this important? Well, Othniel and Aksah are, in their own little way, a picture of the new Adam and Eve in the new Eden. They're the new bride and bridegroom. They've got their new land, a gift from God, that they are called to till and keep. Othniel, the first judge in the book of Judges, will also be called by God to rule and protect this land. Othniel and Aksah have a loving relationship with their father, Caleb being a stand-in for God in this allegory. Aksah asks Caleb for water, and he gives her springs of water. And this water is a symbol of life, the river of life. More on that later. But then, right there in the middle of chapter 1, this, this little Eden starts to fall. Judah, along with Simeon, did the best job of continuing the conquest. Ephraim, Joshua's old tribe, made some progress. But no one else did. Each tribe is listed off. <clears throat> Manasseh did not complete the conquest, and the Canaanites dwelt among them. Naphtali did not complete the conquest, and the Canaanites dwelt among them. So, perhaps 40 years after the Israelites enter the Promised Land, God calls time up. The angel of the Lord appears at Gilgal, Joshua's old base camp, and then... He leaves Gilgal, showing, we're done. The conquest is over. And he says to the people, I brought you out of Egypt. And I brought you into the land that I swore to give your fathers. 
I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land, and you shall tear down their altars. But you have not obeyed my command. What have you done? So now, I will not drive them out before you. They shall be adversaries to you, and their gods shall be a snare to you. And all the Israelites wept and called the place Bochim, weepers. Israel didn't come close to completing the conquest, so now God moves to plan B. Although, after all the events of, of the wilderness wandering, and I think this is probably more like plan Q. What is this plan Q? <laughs> well, it's the cycle of sin and salvation. Judges actually describes this as the cycle that the Israelites chose. God will let the Israelites serve Baal and Ashtoreth as they choose. He'll let the Israelites be conquered by their neighbors. He'll let them cry out for help. He'll rescue them. And then, if they want to forget him, that's their choice. God can't make his people follow him. But he's just not going to let them go. In every generation, he hooks them and brings them back. In every generation, like it or not, God's people are going to see his salvation. They're going to see his supernatural intervention that saves the nation in a way that just couldn't happen any other way. So even though the nation remains on this hamster wheel of doom, some people are still going to see these mighty works of the Lord and turn back to God in the middle of it all. Everything you're saying, I keep visualizing us in present day and how screwed up we are and how far away from God we are. And you know, that's one of the things I kind of hoped people would picture. If we can, I mean, I don't want to go lecture about, oh, our nation is in terrible shape. No, 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 no. But you all know how this can apply to ourselves, our families, our community, our nation. I mean, apply, uh, uh, they can be applied in all these ways and uh, choose whichever way helps you see what you need to do next to follow God. During this period of time, did they have synagogues? No, they did not have synagogues until the Babylonian captivity, that circa 550 BC. What? That could be part of the problem. That is absolutely part of the problem. They've got nothing to remind them of their faith in their everyday life. The tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant are still around. They're in Shiloh. That's great for the people in Shiloh. Everyone else could and should go to make a pilgrimage there, but most of them don't. So they're just kind of left up to themselves to worship. They're just kind of left to themselves to worship, and they start worshiping the gods of the people around them. Hey, uh, sure, I'll, I'll give this guy a try. Maybe he'll listen to me. Which they just don't know any better. And so that, that is one reason why God has so much patience, so much patience with them. Because each younger generation really doesn't know better. 